Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I am joined with the Chief Human Resources Officer of Genpact, Piyush Mehta. And Piyush and I are going to talk about all things innovation and in HR at scale. So Piyush, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to have you start off with an introduction for the audience. Lars, wonderful to be on this uh, podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am the CHRO for Genpact. I've been with this company for the last 20 plus years and in this role for the last 15 years. We are a global company um, of 115,000 people when we last counted, which was yesterday, um, distributed across the world. I operate from India to serve a global leadership team and 115,000 employees spread across the world in a business services company. Uh, I am a career HR person um, and worked for PepsiCo and Unilever before I came to join GE, which later became Genpact and, um, you know, the company that I'm in today. Yeah, so Gen, obviously you're you're operating a uh, global population, 115,000 employees. Um, that's a pretty significant level of, of size and complexity when you're dealing with designing an HR and people strategy. So how is your uh, HR team structured to support that employee base? Yeah, so we, you know, we have a globally distributed workforce, uh, like I said, 115,000 across 30 countries. Um, and the team is structured. The, the primary objective of, of what we are trying to drive or the design principle large, uh, of that structure is to serve our stakeholders, which is our employees and our businesses to be successful. So the model that we've come up with is a little, is, is, is uh, slightly different from what I've seen in practice in other companies. Um, HR is embedded in the business, but you know, to make sure that we are balancing out what needs to get done. Uh, the, the team reports into the business as well as into the function, both solid line. So, you know, it, it helps us drive the uh, functional initiatives across the organization, but equally it helps us serve business needs uh, with that structure. Uh, and that's, that's how we structure it. There is a small corporate, the, the vast majority of the team is focused on serving the business in the business and in the geographies that they work out of. Got it. And so do you have kind of core uh, corporate centers of excellence that support those business units or is it all kind of contained within the, the group supporting the business? No, we have centers of excellence, okay. which develop enterprise-wide programs. Um, and uh, so, you know, in addition to the uh, to the standard centers of excellence, if you will, like compensation and benefits or like talent management, uh, we also drive the agenda on new, new stuff uh, through centers of excellence. So the most recent center of excellence that we've created, for example, in, in the current environment is the Experience and Engagement Center of Excellence. Uh, which looks at making sure that we are able to provide a consumer grade experience to our employees. Uh, and as you would imagine in the current context, that becomes really important. So that's one example of, uh, of a center of excellence that we've created in the, in the recent past to be able to drive uh, a specific agenda there. Another interesting center of excellence is a talent marketing center of excellence, which you know kind of works with uh, the HR team as well as the marketing team. Uh, to be able to build the brand from an employee and an employment perspective. So to drive the employee value proposition and to create impact in the market from a, from a you know, talent marketing perspective. So um, centers of excellence and then, you know, very strong business unit support. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I know you've been with Genpact for over 20 years. Um, the field of HR has evolved dramatically over that time. Uh, and really this, you know, the, the evolution was accelerating pre-COVID. And now over the last two years, it's just been, you know, uh, accelerated magnitudes beyond that. And so when, when you're thinking about uh, how your team is structured to support the business um, and, and how you can take, again, a, a, a kind of massive HR team supporting a massive global workforce uh, and, and make them more agile to be able to adapt to some of these external, uh, you know, pressures and circumstances. H how do you do that? How do you how do you think about kind of uh, managing HR transformation at the scale you're operating in? 
Great question, Lars. So uh, let me start with, you know, how has the need uh, or the reason to exist for the function changed? Um, and I may be a minority here, but in my view, the reason for the function to exist hasn't changed in the last 30 years, at least, you know, ever since I've been in the function. Uh, are, and, and, you know, sometimes I, I feel that this gets more complicated or stated in a more complicated fashion than I think it should. For me, it's very simple. The, the reason for, for my function to exist and for me to exist is to make sure that the talent requirements of the company are met in every possible way and in the best possible way. Now, you know, we can, you know, say the simply the right person at the right place at the right time and at the right cost. But to me, that hasn't changed. The context of that has changed. Uh, you know, the broader ecosystem has, has been through multiple changes and therefore that's created uh, a different set of requirements from what may have worked 15 years back or 10 years back or even three years back. Uh, but it is important to understand that the fundamental reason for us to exist has not changed. Now, you know, in, in the context of what has happened today and to your point, uh, how is it different? I think two or three things have happened. Uh, you know, the, the power of technology, uh, the impact of the pandemic um, has escalated that to 5x or 10x of, of what it what it was before that. In many ways, I think the pandemic, as we all recognize, was unfortunate, huge costs, huge implications. But I think it has increased the pace of adaption of technology. But the answer doesn't lie in technology. I think it's equally about you know, what are the outcomes of the processes that we are working on? Technology is an enabler, but process is equally important. So, you know, if we talk about, for example, consumer grade experience for employees, technology will enable that, but there's a bunch of things that need to go in there. For example, the, the interoperability of systems, uh, the ability to have robust processes, the ability to measure how engagement is moving positively and morale is moving positively. How are we thinking about reskilling given the context of, uh, you know, the half-life of uh, most skills now being two to three years? So, you know, a bunch of those things have changed and have created compelling requirements on functions. The criticality of purpose uh, has become even more important in the, in the talent market that we see today. Uh, the impact of inflation and the ability to build robust talent pipelines uh, in the context of what's happening in the world around us as of, you know, the last few months uh, and the macroeconomic and the geopolitical changes that are happening has been profound. So, you know, a bunch of those things, I, I think, have created some fairly meaningful uh, implications for how the function acts and behaves. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much in your response that I want to go deeper on, uh, and we will. But be, before I do that, uh, one thing just to get your thoughts on, you know, we, uh, we we mentioned a lot of the change, and you you also kind of aptly pointed out what has remained the same in terms of the requirements of the function. Um, when you look at how not just HR, but I think the world of work has evolved since the pandemic, whether it's the shift towards uh, you know, hybrid and distributed work, whether it's the adoption of technology and digital practices, uh, whether it's having different kinds of conversations around uh, uh, social justice and equity and mental health, um, uh, workplace flexibility uh, and, and employees who might be after having spending time, uh, you know, with their families who are able to work remote, you know, they're, maybe they're not as open to going to an office five days a week uh, anymore. And a lot of companies that used to be co-located are now hybrid by default. And how, when you think about kind of all of these different uh, kind of macro changes to the world of work broadly, how does that, how does that show up at GenPack? Like what, how are you, what have you kind of changed or are you continuing to change uh, in the structures of kind of where, when, and how you work around the world? Yeah. So look, I mean, uh, I would approach that uh, that question from you know multiple angles. So let me start with the first one, which is, you know, it's it's brought a very different focus on leadership skills. Uh, 
Okay, uh, the part on empathy becoming a huge differentiator in today's world. You talked about you know mental health and the implications there. Um, uh, the 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 leadership skill that drives collaboration and and thrives on the on the agility and the continuous development uh, and learning and you know that virtuous cycle for it to continue to happen on an ongoing basis becomes very important. The criticality of curiosity. Uh, nobody has has the answer to everything alone. Uh, and therefore, the power of a group of really smart people to come together and to be able to solve for client challenges and to be able to create client, client outcomes together and learn from each other uh, becomes very important because the world around us is changing so fast and the pace of that change is so fast uh, that the, the ability to be curious, I think, is probably one of the key, key skills going forward. And, you know, in that way, curiosity is linked to agility. It's linked to humility. It's linked to, uh, you know, learning, unlearning, and learning every day. So, you know, to me, all of this falls together very nicely when we think about curiosity, when we think about the tolerance for ambiguity. So I think those are the implications on leadership skills, if you will, to start with, you know, one perspective of looking at it. The second thing is, I think culture has become so, so important. And, and culture... Uh, married to the purpose of the organization or the reason why the organization needs to exist, the North Star to which the organization needs to navigate to, the, uh, the, the permanent things which an organization exists for because, you know, commercial goals change and, and that's not going to be the driver for people to want to, uh, you know, come and make the world a better place. Um, so that becomes really important. Um, the, the whole idea of how we think about career development in the context of reskilling. You know, creating a scalable engine, Lars, for uh, 100,000 plus people, uh, which is contextual, which allows us to learn every day, and then facilitates that learning and unlearning so that we are continued, you know, think about the, you know, we did a very quick exercise. What are the skills that are relevant today? We picked 50 skill sets. We built our learning curriculum around that. We spent actually not more than a week figuring out those 50 skill sets. I would argue that 10 years back, we would have spent months figuring out those 50 skill sets. Mm -hmm. and, and what the insight in that for us is because nothing is permanent. I think one of the changes that has become very important is the world is a lot less binary in terms of the solutions that we build. Um, think about workforce flexibility. Is it going to be about 100% return? Is it going to be about no return? I think the answer lies in between. As we think about flexibility, Again, it's about the lack of binariness, if you will, in the solutions that you build. And I think that is becoming more and more pervasive. And, and we are learning with that as we are going along. Then the whole piece that you referred to on you know, driving diversity, driving inclusion, driving community impact have become a very fundamental part of you know, how organizations need to think. And at least we believe it's hugely critical. The fundamental driver for that, again, is you know, the organization needs to reflect the way our clients and customers are today. And if we are talking about the, the broader world or the Fortune 500 companies as our key focus area, then our organization needs to look and feel like their clients and their customers to be able to serve them better because it's that diversity of thought which could be driven by gender, which could be driven by race, which could be driven by, you know, a bunch of other things that 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 get figured into the inclusion agenda. So I think all of these things become hugely, hugely important. You raised a really interesting point that I think speaks to part of the evolution of the field, which was, um, you know, the world of work today is not binary. Um, even to the point where, you know, three years ago, I think specifically kind of in HR and how we approach things, our, our approaches tended to be pretty binary. Like the, the idea of having flexible work structures and policies and programs was often not something you saw. And if it was flexibility, it was like, you have choice A or choice B. Like that's that's your choice. And I think now it's it's becoming much more of a spectrum. And I think a lot of times for smaller organizations, 
you know, it, it's easier for them to frame that because they're not dealing with the same scale and complexity and uh, geographic or cultural, you know, nuances that uh, that an organization like yours does. And so, how do you like when you when you kind of plan and and develop this vision for this this new structure that is you know less binary, uh, more fluid, has more optionality. How do you think about like how and where you apply that to your your HR and people systems? Yeah, you know, I I don't I don't believe we've cracked the code on this yet. Okay, it is evolving. So, uh, Lars, I would I would say with a fair amount of certainty that pretty much every HR person you talk to will tell you the future is, you know, a hybrid workplace, which is the easy answer, right? Now, when you think about a hybrid workplace. Uh, and we think about 100,000 employees. I think about, let's think about teams which are like 20 people, 30 people, 40 people. Now, based on the nature of work, you could decide whether this is going to be work from anywhere or is going to be work from a particular location. Now, what becomes interesting then is that the people in that group may not all work for the same, everything, you know, the solution that you create for that group may not work for everyone in that team. So it is, you know, you are basically taking flexibility to the lowest unit possible. And I think sensitivity to that becomes hugely important, number one. Number two, leverage of technology for that becomes hugely important. So let me give you an example. Uh, Three years back or four years back, the way most companies would look at engagement and morale is that they would have a paper pencil or you know something that substitutes a paper pe paper pencil test on the web, uh, and you do an engagement survey once a year and you come up with an action plan. Now engagement is you know a lot more uh, here and now and changing by the day and changing by the week and changing by the month. So how do you ensure that in an environment like this you create the ability to Mm -hmm. to be in touch with how employees are feeling every single day. So think about an AI-driven tool, uh, which is what we are leveraging right now. It's called Amber. The name is not important, but I'll just refer to that for ease of uh, communication going forward. Amber reaches out to employees real-time as many times as we want through the year. So... Think about reaching out to 110,000 or 115,000 employees real time and figuring out how they're feeling. And based on the responses that we are getting, the machine is learning and asking intelligent questions which are relevant to engaging with the employee at that point of time. And that feedback is coming to us real time saying, you know, this is how this particular employee, this particular cohort, this particular geo, this particular business is feeling uh, from an engagement perspective and from a morale perspective. So, you know, enabling smart, experience-oriented uh, processes, leveraging technology will become really important. Think about, uh, you know, with the pandemic, one of the challenges we ran into was, you know, you would have, we were missing the, quote unquote, water cooler conversations, right? Um, we partnered with Microsoft to build something called the virtual water cooler. Now, what that does is that it looks at, it uses a concept called organization network analysis to look at who are the people you normally would have networked with in the organization. It then picks that group of people and creates an automatic meeting invite that goes into my calendar and Lars's calendar. If Lars is a person I would have normally associated with and would have run into with the water cooler based on my network analysis and sets up a 15 minute meeting, which is just a catch up and, you know, um, shooting the breeze type of conversation. So what we are trying to do is, again, leveraging technology to be able to enable a different kind of workplace which allows for the same good stuff to happen in a different setting based on the on the drivers in the broader ecosystem today make sense yeah definitely makes sense and i think it's it's interesting like the the point you keyed on around the lack of those um you know 3d so to speak water cooler moments that we that we lack in remote environments 
that's something that everybody is is still trying to solve, right? I think that uh, you know there, nobody can point to one solution and be like, "Yep, this is how you do that," because it's it's so there's so much variance between the company and the culture and the way that they work and and so many other variables. And so it's interesting to see how you're using uh, you know that that tool and that platform to do that. And and I think that that connects to the broader kind of organizational culture. And, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, kind of the purpose of the organization being uh, uh, the North Star and kind of an, an anchor for that culture, even though the culture is, you know, not static. And, and, and even the, the, the purpose isn't necessarily static. Business needs change, priorities change. Um, but especially for you in a distributed environment, how do you connect employees with the purpose um, particularly in an environment where, you know, maybe if they were in an office, you'd have more, more things in that office just to reinforce the mission, vision, values, purpose, uh, in a distributed setting, you don't necessarily have those to help reinforce. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on like how you think about reinforcing purpose on an individual level, uh, across the scale you operate in. Yeah. So, uh, look, I mean, one is, you know, the purpose of the organization is, and, and it's an interesting journey, and I'll spend a few minutes talking to you about how we arrived at, uh, you know, the purpose of the organization and the journey. So, and, and then we can talk about, you know, how you make it alive every day. Uh, so, you know, 100,000 people across 30 countries, uh, we, for us, it was very clear we needed to articulate our purpose very clearly. Uh, and we were in the in the process of defining our purpose before the pandemic, looking for the right articulation of the you know of 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 a way in which we could talk about and bring to life the impact we have on the world around us. Okay, so and and what was important was it was also about articulation of the emotional connection uh, that that we wanted to establish with that purpose. And then COVID hit, and our you know people continue to do what. In, an, in, in just a delightfully, shockingly amazing way, they continue to do what they've always done, which is help our clients be resilient through the storm, help the communities that we work with adapt. And, you know, through all of this chaos, uh, help one another uh, through perhaps what is, you know, hopefully uh, the most devastating crisis of our time and hopefully we will not have to see another one like that. And then we came, you know, it was almost intuitive then the way we came up with the purpose, which is the relentless pursuit of a world that works better for people. Uh, and therefore, you know, that purpose is not, first of all, different from the fundamental reason that we believe we exist for. Think about serving our clients. Uh, you know, think about the impact that we create when we serve our clients. So that becomes a very important thing that we highlight all the time. Think about another way of looking at it is, for example, what is the role that HR plays in this organization? Uh, and the way I think about it, and you know, I, I, I talk to my team uh, about it, is we are helping people achieve their potential. We're giving them an opportunity to achieve their purpose, uh, you know, to, to achieve their potential. That fits so seamlessly into the pursuit of a world that works better for people. And therefore, bringing that alive in everything that we talk about, uh, it isn't about, you know, commercial goals are important. We are a publicly listed company and, you know, all publicly company, uh, listed companies have to think about the quarter and, you know, the, the, the year and so on and so forth. But to be able to take that in the context of the broader purpose is, is something that is the role of the leadership team. Uh, it's driven by the CEO. It's driven in all our communications. It's driven in all our, um, you know, all our career development conversations. Um, and about, So let me give you another example. Think about the run that's happening on digital talent or transformation talent across the world, right? Now, when we go out there to bring people in and to hire people, we are competing with some of the biggest companies in the world, some of the biggest brands in the world. But to be able to talk to them through our purpose and say that you have an opportunity to come work in this company, use your digital prowess 
to be able to make an impact on clients which is very visible and make the world a better place therefore becomes a very powerful reason for people to come and work with us. So those are some of the things that we have put in place to make sure that the purpose comes alive um, and, and meaningfully impacts our employee value proposition. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could, as you mentioned, you know, earlier, one of your centers of excellence around um, talent brand and employer brand, and I could see the kind of extension of that into the marketplace. So that's kind of the, the, the tip of the spear, if you will, of kind of bringing your purpose out um, to the talent pools that you're trying to attract into the organization and then extending it throughout the organization. So, you know, that that first touch point for them uh, is consistent through, you know, the recruitment process, onboarding and then employee experience after they've come into the organization. You said it better than I did. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I will, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate the way you've framed it. Um, you know, Piyush, when you think about this, this new world of work that we're building, all these changes that are happening, and, and more specifically, kind of our role in HR in, in shaping and building this, this new world of work, what gets you most excited when you, when you think about what lays the head in this future that we're all actively building right now? Look, I, I, I think, first of all, this is a tremendous time and a tremendous opportunity um, with what's happening around us. Um, you know, the, the, the past at which we've come to, uh, number one, um, you know, it's made, you know, to, to deploy a cliche, it's made the world an even flatter place from a talent perspective. I think that's one. Uh, two is that, it is a huge opportunity for functions like ours to continue to attempt to get out of the silos which they existed in to serve the business better. I think it is a it is a huge opportunity. Uh, if I look at you know the world in today's context in today's macroeconomic context, think about inflation, think about think about the you know the run on talent, think about all of that stuff. The function has become far far more critical to the business for the existence of the business in itself. Huge opportunity, okay? Think about what we do from a reskilling perspective in partnering with the business. It has become a strategic imperative uh, for businesses. It's not a good to do or an quote unquote HR thing alone. So, you know, if I th think about the power of the, we are in a perfect situation today to be able to blend technology and process. Think about, you know, the conversation we've been having on experience. All of this, actually, the business is hungry for these changes. Uh, and therefore, for me, it is a massive opportunity to, um, to leverage, to be able to serve our clients better uh, and see immediate impact of that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's such an, an interesting time, um, a dynamic time, and it's just, you know, there, there's so many things you've talked about from employee experience to the half-life of skills to culture to instilling purpose uh, in it and, and so much more. You know, these are all, you know, not, not all of them are necessarily new for the field, but they're all things that are intersecting in ways that they never have, and I think it's elevated the function um, and, and it's certainly put us in a position where, you know, we have this, what I view as a generational opportunity to redesign work itself. And so, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed learning more about how you're doing that at GenPact and your approach there. You know, if you were, I know you've worked in HR, uh, you know, most of your career, um, I'm your career coach now. I'm taking you outside of HR. You have to do something different. Uh, what, what do you think it would be? Uh... I would um, I would want to be somewhere in the world of sport, and okay. that's not necessarily driven by talent. Uh, that's more driven by aspiration. I just I just uh, uh, am fascinated by the world of sport. Uh, if I had a choice, I would be a professional sports person. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the talent for it, uh, and therefore landed in HR. So, uh, mm -hmm. if if that was your question, if if I if I was 
if I've answered your question right, or was there a different? Uh, no, you have, but I'm going to make you get specific. Uh, what what sport would you be? Uh, so you could, you know, well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you talent now. You can play any professional sport uh, you would like. What would it be? Uh, I, you know, this is a this is a childhood dream, uh, if you will. I've always been fascinated by the idea of a professional athlete, um, you know, um, wearing the colors of my country and, uh, you know, doing a victory lap in a stadium. Uh, so, uh, and that was primarily based on track and field events in athletics. Uh, I've been fascinated by that. It's it's kind of like a dream that's embedded uh, deep inside somewhere. So I'll have to, uh, you know, uh, I'll have to say that's the truth. Okay. Um, and Piyush, last question for you. Um, who is one HR leader who you admire and why? Ah, so, uh, you know, uh, there is a guy called Larry Emmon. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to be with Gallup for many years. He's kind of, uh, you know, he's my coach, friend, mentor, uh, and looks out for me. Uh, what I find incredible about Larry is, uh, you know, just his ability to make everything so simple um, and, uh, you know, put a business context to it. I think that is very powerful. I think the second thing that I've learned from Larry is the power of the network. Uh, the ability to collaborate and connect uh, across uh, what I would say is uh, the largest number of uh, CHROs who are just an email or a phone call away from him, uh, I find incredible because there is such an opportunity for learning uh, in all of that. There is such an opportunity for curiosity in that. I think uh, uh, so uh, Larry will probably be embarrassed that I've quoted him on this, but uh, I actually see him as uh, someone I admire tremendously. Well, Piyush, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you helping us all get to know a little bit more about uh, what you're building at Genpact and uh, definitely want to wish you the best with all of your uh, projects. Thank you, Larry. Really exciting times and uh, appreciate your time in talking about these.